You are listening to Target Australia, Japanese submarine attacks on Sydney and Newcastle, episode 3. This is an audio-only episode. The Japanese mother and support submarines that had launched the second special attack flotilla of Taipei midgets against Sydney Harbour on the 30th of May 1942 had spent several fruitless days and nights waiting for the return of some or all of the small vessels. None returned, which hardly came as a surprise to the Japanese following the fates of the midgets launched against Pearl Harbour six months previously. The young officers and men who had cast off from the big I-class submarines and penetrated Sydney Harbour had demonstrated in their letters and final words a willingness to die for the Emperor and their families, and a realisation that they were probably on one-way missions for Japan. The five I-class submarines abandoned their vigil in early June and moved off up the Australian coast in order to hunt merchantmen assigned as the second part of their mission into Australian waters. Following the surprise midget submarine attack on Sydney and several Japanese submarine attacks on merchant ships off the Australian coast, Sydney and the nearby port of Newcastle were closed to outward ship traffic. Convoys were immediately instituted for coastal commerce in a belated attempt to warn off Japanese submarines from further mercantile interdiction, leaving only the smallest coastal craft to fend for themselves. The RAAF, assisted by a squadron from the Netherlands East Indies Army Air Corps, conducted anti-submarine sweeps over the sea approaches to both ports and convoy routes along the coast, assisted by naval ships. All these precautions, however, did not prevent a pair of Japanese submarines from the original Sydney attack force from striking the Australian mainland in another daring and bold pair of attacks. At dusk on the 3rd of June, the Type C-1 submarine I-24 was recharging her batteries while sitting on the surface east of Sydney. Sharp-eyed lookouts spotted a coastal steamer making her way quietly along, quite alone and Commander Hanabuza brought his boat to immediate readiness for attack. The ship was the 4,734-ton Age, and Hanabuza fired a single torpedo at the ship but missed. The deck gun was swung into action against the freighter, which was naturally attempting to make off as fast as possible, and four shells slammed out across the ocean as the merchant ship's radio operator called desperately for assistance. None of the shells found their marks, and the age disappeared into the evening gloom. When Hanabuza saw the ship disappear, he assumed that he had managed to sink her, and recorded a victory for the I-24 in his report of the action. About an hour and a half later, Hanabuza had something genuine to report. Still east of Sydney, the I-24 encountered the Iron Chieftain, a British coke carrier, on her way from Newcastle to Wyala. Hanabuza launched two torpedoes at the 4,800-ton ship, one of which struck the freighter squarely amidships on her port side, and within only five minutes the Iron Chieftain was gone. Another victim, the Japanese inshore submarine campaign against Australia. Two days later, a third target presented itself to the I-24, the 3,362-ton Australian merchantman Echunga, when the Japanese submarine was about 17 miles off Wollongong. On this occasion, Hanabuza failed to achieve a hit on the freighter and broke off his attack. The Type B-1 submarine I-27 intercepted the Australian freighter Barwon of 4,200 tonnes off Garbo Island, New South Wales, on the 4th of June and attempted to sink her with both torpedoes and gunfire. The Barwon managed to flee without sustaining any damage. Later that same day, the I-27 was cruising through the Bass Strait off Cape Howe when she discovered two Australian iron ore carriers travelling in company. A Japanese torpedo struck the 3,353-ton Iron Crown, which sank quickly. The other vessel that was sailing with the doomed ship, the Iron King, opened fire on the surface Japanese submarine, but the I-27 easily evaded the shots and made off. On the night of the 8th of June 1942, the I-24 was laying about nine miles off the Macquarie Light, Sydney, 
preparing to move towards the city. Motoring on the surface, proceeding northwest towards the coast, Hanabusa quietly brought his boat close in to the heads, the land masses marking the entrance to Sydney Harbour. Hanabusa's plan was simple, unleash the deck gun in the general direction of the famous Harbour Bridge. The silence of the night was suddenly shattered by the booming report of the submarine's deck gun, followed by the whine of high-velocity shells that ploughed into the districts of Rose Bay, Woolera, Bondi and Bellevue Hill. The Japanese gunners quickly loosed off ten shells, then the I-24 ceased firing and slunk away before the Australians had any time to respond to the surprise assault. By sheer good luck, no Sydney siders were killed by the 140mm shells that came hurtling into the centre of their city in the dead of night, but some damage to property was caused. The Sydney Morning Herald reported that initially Sydney siders thought they were being bombed instead of shelled. Quote, in the seaside suburbs, many people mistook the scream of the shells for screaming bombs coming from aeroplanes. No planes, however, were reported over Sydney, and the air raid alarm was sounded merely as a precaution, unquote. Rather than taking shelter, many local residents opted for a spot of sightseeing. Quote, People made for the open streets and stood in eager groups, watching the flashes of the Japanese deck gun. There was no panic, though many listened intently, fearing that the explosions were caused by bombs and that they would hear the drone of planes overhead. When the air raid sirens began to wail, the lights of Sydney flickered out in a few seconds. Up to this stage, thousands of people all over the city had been merely passive watchers of the gun flashes, which had lit up the sky far to the west of the coastal zone. Unquote. With a sudden blackout, most residents hurried back to their homes, groping for matches and screen torches to enable them to get to their shelters. Why only a few of the ten shells fired by the Japanese actually detonated will probably never be known, but the poor performance of the munitions probably saved many lives throughout the city. The Japanese later contended that it was because the shells were stored on the submarine's weather decks in the ready-use ammunition lockers close to the deck gun that explained the high proportion of duds. Moisture probably had penetrated the shells, making some malfunction occur. The Australians and the Americans were also subjected to coastal deck gun bombardments along the US West Coast, claimed that the Japanese were using the wrong type of projectile against shore targets. The Japanese armour-piercing shell was designed to penetrate the steel hull of a ship and explode within, and the tough shells simply passed straight through the softer brick walls of houses and business premises throughout Sydney, often failing to detonate but still causing considerable damage. Be that as it may, Sydney siders were awakened by the crash and thud of Japanese shells falling on four city districts. Of the ten shells fired by the I-24, nine buildings suffered resultant damage. The people of Sydney, however, were undaunted by their most recent brush with the enemy. Quote, In one case, when a woman discovered her kitchen had been destroyed by a direct hit, she calmly turned off the mains gas and steadfastly refused to leave her house. Unquote. Ironically, the only resident who was injured in the attack was a German-Jewish refugee who had fled from the Nazis. A Japanese shell ploughed into his apartment on Mannion Avenue in Rose Bay, but failed to detonate. He was injured when, quote, a heavy metal lampstand fell on his leg when the shell hit the apartment, passed through the room in which his mother was sleeping, and out onto a staircase. He was buried under the rubble, unquote. The Sydney Morning Herald reporter, quickly on the scene, gave this description of the action. The Japanese shell tore through the two brick thicknesses above the head of Mrs. Hirsch's bed, skidded along the wall, flanking her bed, bursting the bricks through in a large gash, but not penetrating to the next room, then pierced the third wall of Mrs. Hirsch's room below the end of her bed, tore through the two walls, flanking a hall, and finished up on a staircase between the first and second floors. Mrs. Hirsch was showered with bricks. Her bed was broken by the falling debris. She herself escaped unscathed. 
The shell, which was still live, lay on the staircase for a time, then an air raid warden carried it into a nearby street. A little later it was removed to Woolera Park Oval and buried. The offending shell was eventually diffused by the Navy and found a new purpose in propping open the doors to the Woolera Council Chambers until recently moved to a museum. Other residents in the apartment block also had lucky escapes. The wife of resident air raid warden W. R. Clarkson recalled later that day, I was awakened by the first shot and looked out the first floor window and found that the rest of the occupants of the flat building were awake. I was looking out of the window when I heard a loud swish and a bang. Pieces of brick from the wall hit me. I then took my two children to a room we had specially prepared for air raids. In another flat inside the block, ten-year-old Barbara Woodward, whose father was another air raid warden, recalled, Mummy fell down, and I was frightened. I heard a bang in the roof and grabbed my kitten, Mr. Churchill, and went with the other children to a room at the back of the flat. Mr. Churchill was not frightened. Outside another apartment block, a Japanese shell exploded in Plumer Street, Rose Bay. The blast, quote, shattered portions of the walls and all the windows and glass doors of Yanambi Flats. People in several flats had narrow escapes from injury as debris fell around them. A woman sleeping in an enclosed veranda was slightly injured by flying glass, unquote. The noise of the Japanese gunfire had drawn many of the apartment block's residents to their windows before the shell landed. One resident recalled later that day, quote, We all seemed to be waiting for something to happen. Then we got it. There was a terrific blast, and the whole building trembled. Everyone rushed to air raid shelters, but there was no panic, unquote. Wardens and police herded thousands of local residents into air raid shelters across the city. Patients at local hospitals were carried down to basement areas for their protection, though local civil defence authorities did some grumbling after the raid concerning some Sydney-siders who had refused to cooperate with them when ordered to evacuate their houses or to take shelter. The evacuations took far longer than the short Japanese attack, and the sites of shell strikes became thronged by eager locals the next day. Photographers snapped pictures of children playing in a huge hole created by a shell outside a small grocery store in Woolera. The economic effects of the Japanese bombardment were negligible, but demonstrated again the Japanese penchant for hit-and-run nuisance attacks using their submarines, all designed to lower civilian morale as well as cause physical damage to the enemy infrastructure and economy. Civilian morale was not lowered by the bombardment of Sydney, though many people still harboured fantasies of a Japanese invasion of Australia in the backs of their minds. The bombardment of Sydney by the I-24 occurred shortly after midnight on the 8th of June 1942. Two hours later, another Japanese submarine, the I-21, under Commander Matsumura, surfaced at Stockton Bight, approximately six miles northeast of Newcastle. Matsumura's intention was identical to that of his colleague, Commander Hanabusa, namely to bombard important shore targets vital to the Australian war economy. Matsumura's attack was to prove to be three times heavier than that launched upon Sydney on the same night, but on this occasion local Australian defences were able to reply, if ineffectually. In 20 minutes, the I-21 unleashed 34 shells from her deck gun into the city of Newcastle, causing some damage, although once again the armour-piercing anti-ship ammunition used by the Japanese mainly failed to explode on contact with buildings and road surfaces and either ploughed through brick walls or buried themselves deep in the earth. The Japanese were targeting Newcastle's BHP steelworks and shipyards, but because of the range, darkness, and the motion of the submarine on the surface of the sea, accuracy was difficult, and shells ended up landing all over the city and in the sea. Newcastle was not blacked out because no warning had been received. But as soon as the bombardment began, local residents started to head for air raid shelters or their basements. The Japanese naval gunners had immediately to hand the 20 shells stored inside the ready locker beside the deck gun, and they also requested a further 14 to be brought topside during the engagement from the submarine's magazine below decks.
Included in the 34 shells fired that night were eight star shells sent aloft to provide the Japanese with increased illumination to try to discern their targets and fall of shot. A local reporter noting inaccurately that, quote, flare shells appeared in the sky over Newcastle before the explosions began, unquote. The local defence of Newcastle was provided by the Fort Scratchley Battery, located inside the fort of the same name on the shoreline, and by the Rail Battery, which consisted of a pair of First World War vintage Hotchkiss two-pounder emplaced field guns that protected the river mouth. Fort Scratchley's searchlights failed to pinpoint the I-21 as she sailed closer to Newcastle, firing as she went, though the fort's gunners could clearly discern the submarine's deck gun muzzle flashes every time she fired. It took the Fort Scratchley battery 13 minutes before they returned fire at the I-21. The battery's commanding officer, Captain Watson, roughing out a fairly accurate range and bearing on the Japanese submarine from the tell-tale flashes of her gun. A communications telephonist then reported, Fire Command says engage when ready, sir. Captain Watson is then reported to have said, Tell them I bloody well have. The big guns at Scratchley fired only four rounds in reply to the I-21's 34 before the submarine made off. As the Japanese submarine manoeuvred and fired, the gunners in the fort had experienced trouble depressing their barrels sufficiently to engage the target one of their four shots removing part of the roof of the Electricity Commission office building in the city. Some of the Japanese shells fell harmlessly into the sea. Some exploded on the surface in white plumes of water, while others remain on the seabed to this day, unexploded. Other shells crashed into buildings across the city. One landed next to the tram depot, another tore through a row of houses in Parnell Place close to the fort. Another penetrated a storage shed, the BHP Steelworks, which was probably Matsumura's primary target, while yet another exploded at the Newcastle Ocean Baths, a swimming pool by the beach. With so much steel flying about, it is a wonder that civilians were not killed or seriously injured. One soldier, who had been asleep in the fort when the attack began, leapt out of bed and twisted his ankle, and two civilians were injured by falling masonry in the city, but casualties remained negligible. The next day's edition of the Newcastle Morning Herald hailed the luckiest boy in town, a story about a young boy and his brother, who had been watching the action from their bedroom window at Parnell Place when the fort scratchly guns had opened fire close by. With ringing ears, the boy's mother herded them downstairs to the lounge, just as a Japanese shell had slammed through the window of the recently vacated bedroom, cut the boy's bed in two, and set fire to the room's contents. Dozens of properties throughout Newcastle were left scarred by shrapnel, and a good many window panes were shattered or cracked by the concussions from the Fort Scratchley guns opening fire. It has been surmised that had the Japanese managed to land 34 conventional 140mm high-explosive shells throughout Newcastle instead of the inappropriate anti-ship shells actually used, very considerable damage and loss of life would have occurred. Fort Scratchley has gone down in history as the only Australian fort to engage an enemy surface target in wartime and is now a museum. The Newcastle Morning Herald had much to say about the twin attacks on Sydney and Newcastle, most of it concerning the lessons to be learned from such events. Quote, the reaction of Newcastle and Sydney to the raids and to the firing of East Coast batteries in anger for the first time in Australian history was one of curiosity mixed with irritation at the disturbance at a night's rest. Perhaps the enemy's attack was not so stupid as might appear. His purpose was intimidation. He was testing civilian nerves, and doubtless hoped by this demonstration that he still has a number of submarines off our coast to slow down production and to limit the use of our coastal waters. Its effect was to annoy, not frighten civilians, and to hammer home the need for vigilance, for increased production, and for lending every energy to the great task of keeping Australia free and restoring the freedom of the seas." Unquote. 
The reporter perhaps summed up quite neatly the feelings of most Australians following the midget submarine attacks and two recent gun bombardments. Quote, if the Japanese plan to lower civilian morale, they succeeded only in disturbing a complacency of which we are well rid, and in spurring our determination to make an end of such impertinences, together with more serious affronts to our national pride and honour. Australia would not be frightened by the seeming impunity with which the Japanese were able to strike at the country. Indeed, the local newspaper warned the residents of Newcastle that one of the reasons the Japanese had been able to strike at the city was the lack of a brownout during non-alert times. The newspaper commented that the instinct to switch on lights and watch the proceedings is potentially dangerous. Curiosity is natural, but it killed more than cats, and it cannot be impressed too strongly on civilians that they will serve their own and the community's interests best by keeping lights off and going quietly to shelter. The Japanese midget submarine attacks on shipping in Sydney Harbour and the subsequent bombardment of the city's suburbs and the city of Newcastle by the large I-class submarines was not part of an elaborate Japanese invasion plan the Japanese never seriously considered invading the continent. At the time of the Japanese midget submarine attacks on Sydney Harbour, Australia appeared isolated and indeed in imminent danger. Darwin, Derby, Catherine and Broome in the north had all suffered serious attention from Japanese bombers. Nearly every outpost of the British Empire in the Far East, Malaya, Hong Kong and Singapore, to mention the most significant, had fallen to the seemingly relentless Japanese war machine, and thousands of Australian servicemen had been taken prisoner. The fighting in New Guinea was fierce, as Australian and Japanese troops fought each other, the jungle and disease along the Kokoda Trail. It was imperative that the Australians retain control of Port Moresby and just as imperative for the Japanese to possess it. Certainly the Japanese Navy was interested in isolating Australia by interdicting her merchant fleet, and by the aerial bombing of her northern towns and cities, but this strategy also became increasingly difficult following Japanese losses at the Battle of Midway in 1942. The myth that Australia was saved from a Japanese invasion by the fighting along the Kokoda Trail in New Guinea or the Battle of the Coral Sea are simply not supported by actual Japanese plans. By early 1942, after the Japanese had invested the Netherlands East Indies, now Indonesia, Japan was within striking distance of the Australian mainland, and a few Japanese naval officers mooted a plan to extend the empire's conquests onto the continent itself. The Imperial Japanese Army, however, immediately balked at such a plan, and killed it at the earliest possible opportunity. The army's reservations were not based on a lack of courage or ability, but rather on the very practical manpower problems they faced as the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, the Japanese euphemism for their new empire in the Far East, rapidly expanded. The Japanese found themselves by mid-1942 in a similar situation to Germany, fighting a war on two fronts. After June 1941, approximately three-quarters of the German army was fully occupied fighting the Soviets in European Russia, leaving the remainder to hold off the British and Americans elsewhere. So the Imperial Japanese Army faced an equal challenge, namely the occupation of eastern China and Manchuria, and constant war with the Chinese nationalists and communists on the one hand, and total war against British, American, Australian, Dutch and New Zealand forces in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Prime Minister John Curtin and the Australian government knew of Japanese reservations concerning invading the continent from intelligence briefings derived from intercepted and decrypted Japanese radio traffic. But fear of an invasion served as a useful propaganda tool to rally the Australian people behind the war. Government posters were issued, one infamously proclaiming of the Japanese, he's coming south, to reinforce in the minds of ordinary Australians the grave danger they faced and the necessity of pulling together and supporting the war and the Curtin government. 
Curtin and General Douglas MacArthur, who had been in Australia since March 1942 after leaving the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines, had been informed of the Japanese abandonment of an invasion plan in early 1942. But Prime Minister Curtin withheld this information from the Australian people. The submarine attacks on Sydney and Newcastle in May only served to reinforce what Curtin had been warning, and it was only in mid-1943 that Curtin announced that no Japanese invasion was expected in the foreseeable future. Curtin was right in withholding this information, because the threat of invasion galvanised Australia to prosecute the war against Japan. The problem for historians has been the persuasiveness of Curtin's argument. He did such a thorough job of inculcating a belief in a planned Japanese invasion in the minds of Australians that this myth persists even today. As for the submarines responsible for strengthening Curtin's hold over Australia, Commander Hanabusa and the I-24 struck again just after the sun rose on the 9th of June 1942, southeast of Jarvis Bay launching a submerged attack on the British freighter Orestes of 7,500 tonnes. However, both of the torpedoes that Hanabusa fired malfunctioned and blew up before reaching their target. Frustrated, the Japanese officer ordered his submarine to the surface, and he determined to sink the Orestes with his deck gun. Fortunately for the Orestes, although the crew of the Japanese submarine banged away at the fast-retreating freighter, they only scored a single hit that caused minimal damage. But they continued firing until Hanabusa ordered the attack halted and broke off contact with the freighter. The I-21 continued with her mission along the Australian coast well into June 1942. On the 12th of June, the submarine was 40 miles off Sydney when the lookout spotted an eight-ship, lightly defended coastal convoy. The convoy was proceeding from Newcastle to Wyala. At 1.14am, Commander Matsumura fired four torpedoes at the convoy, the spread designed to strike two of the eight ships, making their way slowly along the coast. One of the torpedoes struck the 6,000-ton Guatemala, a Panamanian-registered coke carrier that had been chartered by the Australian government. Within an hour, the crew had taken to the boats and the Guatemala had sunk. Thereafter, the I-21 headed for base, arriving at Kwajalein on the 25th of June before cruising to Japan for a major overhaul. In all, the Eastern Advanced Detachment sank six merchantmen during this operation, but the yield of these actions was disappointing. Too much effort had been expended at the outset in launching the unorthodox midget submarine attacks. Also, many of the torpedoes had malfunctioned in the many attacks launched on merchant ships. The detachment failed in its most important mission of cutting the supply lines between Australia and its British and American allies. Once again, the Japanese submarine force had only partially succeeded in its allotted tasks and had lost a great many well-trained and committed officers and men in the process. Japanese submarines would continue to operate around Australia on and off throughout the rest of World War II, but they never again would close up to the coast and attack coastal settlements and cities. You have been listening to Target Australia, Japanese Submarine Attacks on Sydney and Newcastle, Episode 3, written and narrated by Dr. Mark Felton. For a wide variety of military history programs, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below. Thank you.